Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this morning, FSA and COBRA updates as well as solutions, and it will be presented by TASC. And today's webinar, just so you know, will be recorded, and you will receive a copy of the recording as well as the slides tomorrow. I am Stacy Reeder, the Marketing Director for Beer and Purvis, and I will be joining Cinnamon Trimpey, the Regional Sales Director for TASC, as she presents today, and we're very pleased to have her with us to review both the FSA and COBRA updates. Now, as, as many of you may already be aware, we partner with TAS to offer free and discounted services through our Broker Picks program. TAS, COBRA, and FSA are available through this program, which means we will cover the first year of cost for COBRA, or the setup fee for FSA when your clients enroll 20 or more with one of our medical carriers. And, you know, even if your groups don't qualify for a free service, you can still obtain discounted pricing for these services. Uh, we do have information on our Broker Picks program a bit on our website or from any member of your Baron Purvis sales team. So if you're meeting with your sales rep, certainly feel free to ask them about it. But also include information in the follow-up email that we are going to send um, to you tomorrow. Now, before I turn everything over to Cinnamon, I just want to remind everyone that you are placed on mute. So if you do want to ask questions, please submit them in writing. And then I'll do my best to ask those questions, you know, at the appropriate point of the presentation. But, you know, sometimes the questions get backed up. And for those that are missed, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So, and we also will be recording today's presentation. So in addition to the slides and information on our Broker Picks program, we'll also provide you with a link to the recording as well. So I want to, we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn control over to Cinnamon, which I'm doing right now, and we can get started. Wonderful. Thank you, Stacey. Um, and thank you all for attending the webinar today. So my name is Cinnamon Trimpey, and I work with TASC. We are a national third-party administration company. I do need to um, just put this confidentiality statement out there. Stacy will be able to send you a copy of what we've presented today, but um, it is just a compliance issue that we need to put out there. So I am the Northern California Regional Sales Director. Um, I do work with most of Northern California. We do have another rep out there that works with um, some of the Bay Area as well as the Central Valley. I've been in the insurance industry for 15 years, and I've been with TASC for six years. And we've changed quite a bit um, over the years since I first started. But we briefly want to introduce TASC to you, and we will recap that again at the end. Briefly review the Section 125, talk about a few of the changes that have come through the Affordable Care Act. Then we will review COBRA today and talk about why our solutions will will or may work for your clients. Excuse me, Cinnamon. Uh-huh. Would you mind putting in um, the full presentation mode, so just in case oh, sure. the full screen. Is thing. that better? Yeah, thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Stacy. There we go. So we are a national third-party administrator for employee benefits and also compliance services and that our benefits and services do enhance the products of your clients with their existing uh, benefit program. We are the largest privately held third-party administration company in the U.S., and we were established in 1975. Many of you may have known us from the early 2000s where our uh, sweet spot was really a smaller group, maybe a 16 to 50 marketplace. We now, through several acquisitions and enhancements of our proprietary systems, are able to serve small and large businesses as well as Fortune 500 and pu public sector companies. I apologize that that keeps coming up. We are headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, but I am here locally out of Sacramento. And we have um, close to 1,000 employees now with uh, recent acquisitions um, throughout the U.S. We do offer several services, so we have benefit account management. Our flexible spending account is what we'll be focusing today on. We also have transit and parking, um, which may be of some interest for the Bay Area clients. We have HSAs, HRAs, tuition reimbursement. 
wellness rewards and a new offering called Workplace Giving Administration. We do also uh, provide COBRA administration, FMLA, retiree billing, and several compliance services. So we'll get into those uh, FSA and COBRA parts, and then we will talk about what else we do. So a, flexing, a flexible spending account was enacted in 1978 under Section 125. And then it has been revised several times throughout the years, um, dating up to current times. It does also address the Family Medical Leave Act, changes in family status, and um, most recently under the Affordable Care Act, there were some changes, and we'll talk about those briefly later on in the presentation. <clears throat> so a flexible spending account is also known as a Section 125 plan, a cafeteria plan, and your employers may know it as one of those when they're referring to it. The main part of the Section 125 plan is the health care FSA, and that is basically where the employee is allowed to elect that salary deferral to pay for eligible health care expenses. And that's for all eligible expenses that are medically necessary and associated with a medical condition. I, there used to not be a limit on that, and with recent legislation through the Affordable Care Act, the limit has been reduced to $2,500 annually. And to date, we do not have any cost of living increases, um, but that may come at some time in the future. And then October 31 of 2013, um, the option that we've all been asking for came, and uh, that's the carryover as it pertains to our use it or lose it rule. Additional tax benefit programs, so the premium only plan can also be offered in lieu of the full flexible spending account. We've got the dependent care account, the transit reimbursement account, the parking reimbursement account, a non-employed sponsored premiums and disability insurance, and then term life. And each of those has their own independent section with their own guidelines. And we do all offer all of those at TASC. Under the Affordable Care Act, of course, there was the health care FSA limitation. So with that being said, the salary deferral part for the employee is limited to $2,500 per calendar year. The employer, however, can put in additional dollars above that, uh, but in order for the plan to remain a HIPAA-accepted benefit, it needs to not be any more than $500 into that benefit. And also, over-the-counter medications were <clears throat> eliminated to the point that they are only allowed with a prescription or a medical necessity form provided by TASC that the doctor has to sign off on. They do need to provide that medical condition or else the claim will actually be denied. But if you do use certain over-the-counter medications on a regular basis for you know, allergies or um, heart maintenance as far as aspirin, those things can still be purchased pre-tax. You just have to go through a few extra steps to get those reimbursed. So the advantage of offering a Section 125 plan to the employees is, of course, the pre-tax dollars. And on average, it is between a 20 and 30 percent uh, reduction in taxes. Now, that includes the federal and state taxes as well as any FICA um, taxes that are included. <clears throat> It does offset the rising health care costs, so you can put the plan in place so that if you were going from a no deductible plan to a deductible plan, the employees can actually put some of that deductible away with pre-tax dollars and pay for those expenses that are outlined in Section 213D. And you can also maximize their, those health care dollars through the tax savings, so in theory, if they are putting money in for their premiums, if there is any cost share involved with that, and once they have reduced their salary, they should actually be in another tax bracket for their ongoing payroll, but then at the end of the year, it also puts them in another tax bracket by reducing their W-2 by the total amount of the elections. 
for all of the benefits that are pre-tax. The employer advantage would be to reduce those payroll taxes, and that is very important in today's world of, uh, you know, where we're getting cited for every little thing and we need to pay those additional expenses. But it also reduces your workers' comp. So when you're calculating that, if you have a high workers' comp rate because, you know, you're in a dangerous field or the employers, you know, they work out in the field a lot, they're auto body mechanics or, you know, they're working with machinery, that's going to reflect a very high workers' comp rate. The payroll is reduced dollar for dollar by every pre-tax deduction. This would be including your 401k. So because of the reduced payroll, it therefore reduces the amount of payroll dollars and reduces the overall workers' compensation amount that is due to your particular carrier. It also is an excellent way to retain and attract employees. When benefits are being taken away or not provided, you can implement a flexible spending account that will promote good employee relations and allow them to have an additional employee benefit. Higher employee participation. So with the recent change of the carryover, we are seeing a 50% increase in participation. That $500 rollover is a no risk to roll over into the next year. So if the employee was hesitant on participating currently because they didn't want to lose their money under the use it or lose it provision, they can now <clears throat> elect the minimum of $500 and then they actually will have that into the next year without losing it. On some circumstances, the employer can also participate. So if they are an S corporation, they are not allowed to participate in any way, whether that is under the premium only plan for their portion of the <clears throat> employer sponsored benefits or in any of the other health FSA or dependent care or benefits offered. So one recommendation that I would make would be to go back to your clients that are S-Corps and, I'm so sorry, um, that are S-Corps and, Stacy, I'm not doing this very well, there we go. Go back to your um, employers that are S-Corporations and make sure that they actually have not included any pre-tax income for them. If they have, they will need to make adjustments. If the employer is anything else other than an S corporation, they can actually participate. They will be subject to non-discrimination rules, but they can participate at a limited level. This is an example of an employer savings with putting money into the healthcare FSA on a pre-tax basis and money put in on a, the dependent care based on 25 employees total, 25 in the healthcare FSA, and then of those 25, 10 in the dependent care. It can actually save the employer, just based on the FICA tax alone, 6,600 per year estimated. And that will well cover any plan, as well as possibly putting in voluntary benefits or some other benefits that maybe they were not able to use before. Use it or lose it has always been a concern. Um, and that is because if the employee does not use all of their money during the plan year, they do forfeit that back to the employer. So the grace period has been implemented and, of course, the carryover. Uniform coverage is also a concern. That's a concern on the employer side. It does apply to the unreimbursed medical portion. And that indicates that the total election by the employee has to be available on day one of the plan year that employee can then use those dollars 100% and then they can leave two weeks later and they're not under any obligation to pay that back to the employer. So there are ways to limit that without violating any of the Affordable Care Act rules or any rules um, of discrimination and one way would be to have a delayed entry period similar to your 401k so rather than have a waiting period as you do with your medical insurance you would have a delayed entry period and possibly have them come in only once or twice a year.
The carryover option must be elected, so it is a part of the use it or lose it, and you must elect that with the third-party administrator that you're using, whether it is um, the grace period of 0 to 75 days or they want the $500 rollover. They don't have to elect all the way up to $500, just as with the grace period. They do not have to elect the full 75 days. The $500 is very attractive, though, so if you have not considered putting an FSA in to your employers previously, now would be a good time, and you can use that $500 carryover as a feature to attract more participation, especially in a smaller group. So, Cinnamon, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So, can we you go back a screen, please? Yes. So, on the carryover, I know the under ACA and an employer now has the option to make a $500 rollover available to employees that participate in the health care FSA. Now, is this only the health care FSA? It is only the health care FSA. Okay. Now, as an employer, I have to choose between the option of giving my employees the rollover option or the grace period. Or can, exactly. we, can we have both as an employer? Can we offer both? You cannot both? have both. You do have to choose one or the other. Okay, and so... And you do need to make that choice in the beginning of the plan year. All right, so then on the carryover, the $500 carryover, if I understand correctly, that allows me to, if, if, I'm, a, if I'm an employee and I'm unable to, you know, utilize all the funds that I've set aside in my FSA, then that can roll over into the following year and rather than me losing that money. That is correct. Now, if my employer has a grace period instead of the rollover option, I simply have an, up until, is it the end of March of the following year to uh, use that money? Is that correct? The money that I haven't tapped into, this has nothing to do with the rollover. This is just the grace period. That is correct in some situations. So it, that is an employer choice of the number of days that are allowed. So it is up to 75 days, and the employer does not have to allow the full 75 days. They could do a 30-day grace period or a 60-day grace period. So it would depend on what the employer chose for their specific plan. Okay, now on the grace period, am I allowed to, as a, again as an employee, am I allowed to actually incur a cost within that grace period? You are actually able to incur a cost within the grace period. Okay. And, and then, then I, you can submit that into the, in the grace period and also throughout the runout period, which again, the runout period is where you send the receipts in for reimbursement, and that is also determined by the employer. Okay. All right. Is there, now going back to the rollover, I'm sorry, I know I'm going back and forth. I just want to make oh. sure it's under, okay. the differences are understood. Now, is there a maximum limit on the amount that rollover, fund, can they accumulate essentially? Can the rollover accumulate from year to year? There is no accumulation. So it, it is a $500 maximum rollover, so if they rolled over from 2014 into 2015 and they looked at the full $2,500 for 2015, they would have $3,000 available to use. If they had $500 left over at the end of 2015, mm -hmm. that $500 would roll over and again have another $3,000. Okay. So it does not accumulate. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So impact of the Affordable Care Act, um, the over-the-counter medications, that was um, eliminated, unless you have a doctor's note. The dependents are covered until age 26, and there is a maximum contribution. Now, there um, are also some discrepancies within the marketplace regarding the individual premium, and we can discuss that in the end if anybody has any questions. Uh, it's very convoluted and very confusing once you go into the code and the actual guidance, so I don't want to get too much into it, but we do continue to offer that, and it is legal through the, R through the IRS. So any questions on 
the flexible spending account as it pertains to the Affordable Care Act or what we've discussed? Well, I do have a question. So whenever an employer um, comes to task and they sign up for an FSA, does the employer automatically, when they sign up, do they receive the health care FSA plus dependent care plus transit, or how, how do you structure that? Absolutely. So I can talk a little bit about um, the flex system, Section 125 plan with TASC. So when a client comes to us to sign up, our fees do include any and all benefits, including the transit. So if they wanted to um, have a premium only plan, that would strictly be the premium only plan and we would write that accordingly and provide them with their plan document and summary plan description. If they wanted a full Section 125 plan, we would include under that all of the benefits that they would like. Um, the health care FSA, the dependent care, the commuter expenses. Um, if they wanted to include any voluntary benefits to pre-tax, we would be able to do that. We would include the individual premium as well if they wanted to do that. We do not include the life insurance and disability due to the obvious reason that it is um, taxable if it is the premium is pre-taxed. But you can limit the number of benefits that you offer or you can have all benefits. Now the one thing that you cannot do is you cannot carve out. So management versus non-management or salary versus hourly, um, all benefits of have to be offered, offered equally to everyone. Um, we also provide all of the plan documents, all of the summary plan descriptions that are required. We do also handle the non-discrimination testing for them. And then we also would do the 5500 if required. Now with the non-discrimination testing, we do a basic 33% concentration test that is included with the service. If you think that you have a group that may be top heavy, we do have a, a premium service where we have customized non-discrimination testing that we will actually perform three to five different tests to assist the group in passing. It is a misconception that it is a pass or fail, and if you fail that you're done and you know the plan is basically out of compliance. But if you make the steps to put the plan in compliance and have our preferred the premium services testing, we'll actually support you and make sure that your plan is in compliance. Now that is through our audit guarantee. <clears throat> so our audit guarantee indicates that if you follow our instructions for your plan, you make the necessary adjustments if you're found to be out of compliance, and then you maintain compliance in the plan. If you are ever audited, we will stand behind you 100% and pay all penalties and fees that you may be assessed. And we actually do put that in writing in our service agreement and in all of our proposals. And we have yet to do a Section 125 audit, but we have been audited on our biz plan, which is a small HRA 105 plan, where we actually assisted the client through the audit. We went to court and we um, paid the penalties and fees. They were found to be out of com compliance initially, so we did pay that for them. And um, then it was rectified later, and we do have studies on that. Okay. So we all we are all for, we are full service, and you may notice in the marketplace that some of the smaller TPAs are um, being acquired. We do actively acquire other TPAs. So if you know you've worked with FlexCorp or Benassist in the past, um, those are two of our recent acquisitions, and they are now part of Task. Right. I noticed an announcement on that the other day about eFlex System is merged mm -hmm. with TASC. Yeah, I did yes, notice that. Yes, they have merged with us, yes. Okay, I have had a couple of other questions come up. Um, so whenever, do you identify top-heavy groups or do you expect, you know, the broker to bring this, you know, to the employer's attention in order to get the additional compliance testing? Um. 
We would need the broker to identify that and through myself, the RSD, working with the broker and the client, we can assist them in identifying that um, and, you know, determining whether or not that additional non-discrimination testing would be beneficial. Okay. All right. Um, I do also want to ask about um, the grace period again, just to clarify, before we head into COBRA, I want to clear up all the FSA questions. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you did mention that a charge could be incurred within the grace period. Has this mm -hmm. always been allowed to incur an expense within the grace period? Because yes. it was understood that, that you could only incur the expense during the FSA plan year, but you could request reimbursement up through the grace period. So um, the grace period, the main intention for putting that into place was to allow unused dollars in the current plan year to be used up to 75 days into the new plan year. Um, what, what you're referring to as far as being able to submit the receipts would be the runout period. So the runout period has always applied. It's uh, between zero and 90 days. And that is where the employees can use the dollars or submit the expenses for the dollars that they've already used in the current plan year or the prior plan year and through the grace period. So in theory, you have a 14 and a half month plan year. And then after that, last 75 days ends, that plan year is over, and then you can send in receipts if, you ha if you've used the dollars. Okay, so the grace period really was just kind of a, a quasi rollover, <laughs> mm -hmm. so to it's speak. A, it's just an extension, okay. extension of the existing plan. Okay. All right, now um, I do want to, you had mentioned commuter benefits, and I know that for employers that have 50 or more full-time employees in the Bay Area County that they are going to be, I'm sorry, Bay Area counties, it's plural, mm -hmm. uh, that they are required as of 9-1 to begin offering commuter benefits or transit benefits to their employees. Is that something you can touch on briefly? Um, yes. So with that, um, with that ruling, they are required to offer the transit. They're not required to um, do the parking. And with the transit, um, we can actually take care of that for them. And um, I, I believe that is uh, in the city, in the city of San Francisco. Um, not necessarily the additional Bay Area counties. Well, I that is my understanding. Is it all Bay Area counties? Yes. Yes, it is all Bay Area counties. Okay. Um, so we would actually be able to take care of that for them and you can actually do a standalone transit plan um, versus, you know, having a full flexible spending account. Okay. Well, and what I can do for um, our participants today is I can include some information tomorrow whenever we send the follow-up email, I'll include information on the new commuter benefit that, that has to go into effect on, on 9-1. Okay, now I do want to set back one more question, then we can move forward on COBRA. Going back to the top heavy groups, can you actually give a little detail as to what, would a, what a top heavy group would be? So a top heavy group would be um, possibly a technology company. So if you had a small technology company with maybe four or five sales reps or, you know, account managers and maybe a receptionist and an office manager, we would have to evaluate that and determine who we could exclude. First off, are they an S Corp or a C Corp? Um, who we can exclude, uh, you know, based on is anybody being paid more than 115000 a year, uh, time and service, and things like that? Because typically, with the non-discrimination testing, the total of the non-highly compensated employees' contributions 
for each different benefit, that would be insurance premiums, health FSA, dependent care, are totaled up and then the highly compensated can take no more than 33% of that as a whole. So they would have to take that and divide it amongst, you know, all of the <clears throat> highly compensated. So if you had five highly compensated and let's say the two non-highly compensated were putting in 5,000 each for dependent daycare, those highly compensated would only be able to pre-tax $2,000 each in order for the plan to remain compliant. Okay, all right. Another well, type would be I'm sorry, possibly, go ahead. Uh, another one would possibly be an attorney's office. So if you have a firm, um, they are going to be top heavy because your lawyers are going to be, um, they're going to outnumber the staff and they will be mostly, mostly if not all, highly compensated. And so in those circumstances, we would want to evaluate and see if the additional testing would be beneficial. We don't actually do a pretest, but you know, I can sit down with the broker and the client, and we can run some numbers and um, approximate what we would need to do. We cannot guarantee once they actually ran the test in our back office that they would pass, but we can go through it and, you know, do a preliminary assumption. Okay, well, thank you for the additional information. So I think we're, we're um, ready to move forward. Okay. So COBRA compliance, maybe this will go better than my uh, other PowerPoint. <laughs> So the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, um, that applies to federal COBRA. Most of us are familiar with that. It applies to voluntary or involuntary job loss, reduction in hours worked, death, divorce, or other life benefits. So if somebody was let go, uh, depending on why they were let go, they can still elect COBRA. And it does provide for the continuation of the health insurance, the group health insurance, that they would have otherwise been able to maintain if they were working. And that does apply to medical, dental, vision, wellness programs, EAP programs, and so forth. It provides um, health, in health insurance coverage during a transitional period, typically until they get that new job or they're able to get some other sort of benefit. It's usually not cost effective to be on the COBRA plan for the full pro program time. So uh, certain church plans, federal government, and certain small plans, they are exempt from COBRA, from the federal COBRA. A small employer is less than 20 employees employed on 50% of the, or more of the typical business days in the previous calendar year. The same goes for a federally, um, a federal COBRA um, employer, 20 or more. So that would be 21 plus people for 50% or more of the previous calendar year. If that does not apply, then they would be subject to CalCOBRA. And all employees must be counted. It's not just those that are covered. So you would count all employees that are on the quarterly tax return. <clears throat> and all employees of related employers must be counted. So if there is a subsidiary, they would be counted as well. And other states have mini COBRA. That's what they call their um, version of CalCOBRA. And of course, here in California, we do have CalCOBRA. So all employers with 20 or more employees, again, on 50% of the typical year, are subject to COBRA. Part-time employees, you must be, prorate them. Your 1099 employees, which are your self-employed, independent contractors, and your directors, those are not counted. Uh, timelines, so the initial notice has to go out within 90 days of being 
being enrolled in the plan. And that notifies the new enrollee of their benefits under COBRA. If there is a qualifying event, the employer must notify the plan or the administrator if they're using an outside source of the qualifying event within 30 days. That entity then has 14 days to get out the qualifying event letter. And then the participant, the qualified beneficiary, then has 60 days from the date that they receive that to elect. And then once they've elected whatever the date is on that election form, they now have 45 days to get in their payment. If the payment is not received, our procedure at task is that we give a 10-day grace period. So we give till day 45 or 55. And then if we have not received that, we do terminate them from our system. And we notify the employer to terminate them from the carrier. If we do receive the premium payment, then we reimburse that back to the employer. One little caveat if, is that if your employer is administering COBRA on their own, so if they're self-administering COBRA, the 30-day notification period is eliminated. That qualifying event notice now has to go out within 15 days of the qualifying event. So group health plans are subject to COBRA, whether they are self-insured or fully insured. All of your dental, vision, and prescription drug plans, HMOs, PPOs, defined contribution plans, your EAP programs and your wellness programs, and more importantly, there are a lot of HRAs out there and your health FSAs out there, and those are also subject to COBRA. On the HRA, because there is not a premium associated with that, that, do, that does need to be calculated. And that does need to be established at the beginning of the plan year and must be the same for all employees throughout the plan year and for all tiers. So you could create a four-tier, employee only, employee spouse, employee child, employee family. You could do an employee plus one, plus two, plus three or more. You can create any number of tiers, but it must be established in the beginning of the plan year. Your health flexible spending accounts are required to have a COBRA letter sent out if there is a positive balance in the account at the employee's termination. And those are two benefits that may be overlooked for COBRA. So that would be something to go back through and uh, review. So is your group subject to federal group COBRA? This is a misconception you know, in our marketplace. And we put together a scenario. So basically, ABC Company has been in business for 10 years. We have 25 employees during a typical work week. We do have benefits, but only 15 are enrolled. Sometimes the carrier is administering CalCOBRA but that client is Federal COBRA. It's based on the total number of employees employed. Enrollment doesn't matter. Now there are repercussions. So if you have a, federally, a federal employer subject to COBRA and they are offering Cal COBRA, that employee can come back you know, into their next year and actually make the employer pay for any expenses that they incurred because they did not receive that federal COBRA notice. So you have two options at that point. You can continue to do the Cal COBRA and simply send out the federal COBRA notice, which is not our recommendation. Our recommendation would be to talk to your carrier and uh, getting them switched over depending on who that carrier is. And if they're not handling any federal COBRA for you as an additional option, then find a TPA to do that for you. 
A qualified beneficiary is the individual who is covered under the health insurance on the day before the qualifying event takes place. And also the spouse or any dependent children that are covered. And every qualified beneficiary has the same rights as any active employees. So at the open enrollment period, you would want to notify them of any changes, provide them any enrollment forms. If you're putting a new plan in place, you would want to make sure that they were included. So your qualifying events would be your event plus the loss of coverage would equal the COBRA qualifying event. And if it is the loss of coverage under any group health plan, whether it's medical, dental, or vision, or any of the other options that we indicated, COBRA must be offered. <clears throat> Here's a sample. This is actually from the Department of Labor website. So these are the qualifying events. Now, we all, you know, we're all familiar with these. Uh, gross misconduct, I want to discuss a little bit. So that is a determination of the employer as to whether or not the termination was due to gross misconduct. If the employee is not offered COBRA due to gross misconduct and they come back at a later date with, you know, a Department of Labor complaint and that will be investigated and then that determination will be made by the Department of Labor. So you need to be very careful when you're trying to um, advise the client <clears throat> on gross misconduct. Reduction in the number of hours. There are also qualifying events for spouses. And then your non-gross misconduct reasons. I wanted to touch on FMLA. So FMLA is not a COBRA qualified event by itself. When your employees go out on FMLA leave, the employer is required to keep those benefits in place. Now within the FMLA leave period, a COBRA qualifying event can occur. And at that point, the COBRA would be offered. And that is a misconception as well in the marketplace. The qualifying event is typically 18 months for voluntary termination or involuntary termination, if it is, unless it is the gross misconduct. Reduction of hours is also 18 months. But if there is a disability associated, that can get an 11-month extension. If there is a death, the spouse can get an additional 18 months. And then, of course, in California, we have our Cal COPER extension which is another 18 months administered directly to the carrier. The maximum coverage period for the spouse or the dependent would be 36 months from the original date if one of these conditions applies. When the child ceases to be that uh, dependent, and that is governed by the plan, whether it's 24, 25, or 26, then they can be offered an additional 18 months. If the employee dies or divorces, then they can also get that 18 months for the spouse and any enrolled dependents. So just a couple of notes. Um, under the Affordable Care Act, we've had many you know, changes with COBRA. Um, Dental and vision, you know, that is still subject to COBRA. I get a lot of questions that what's going to happen now um, with the Affordable Care Act. Well, you know, unless the bills go through to make the changes to dental, um, then we are going to still have to offer COBRA. So there are still many benefits out there that are COBRA eligible, and you do need to make sure that those notices go out. Um, if anybody is managing COBRA on their own or for any of their clients, there are two updated notices on the Department of Labor website. There is an updated initial notice and an updated qualifying event notice. We put together some common questions, and I get this one a lot. Um, 
And again, there are no wrong or you know, silly questions, but must the employee be enrolled in an employer's group plan in order to be eligible to be offered COBRA? Absolutely. Just because they terminate does not mean that they get COBRA. Another one is what plans will I be offered? Well, I will be offered the same plans that I was enrolled in. So if I was enrolled in the HMO, but I want the PPO, I'm only offered the HMO during my election period. Am I eligible for COBRA if my company closed or went bankrupt and there is no health plan? No. So once the company closes and the health plan goes away, so does the option for COBRA. And if I did not make the premium payment on time and my coverage was canceled, what can I do? Well, that is actually up to the employer. So there is nothing set in stone that says if my payment was late and I was canceled that I cannot be reinstated. So at that point, you would want to direct you know, your employee back to the employer to see if they would reinstate. Because typically there is a little bit of lag time from the date that they were supposed to receive the payment to the date that they notify the carrier. Um, here is my contact information if anybody has any questions. I am out in the field a lot. My inside sales team member is Vladimir. He can provide you with information and proposals as well. Um, so you can take that information down or Stacy will give that to you tomorrow. And then lastly, any questions? Yeah, we do, we do have a few questions, Cinnamon. Mm -hmm. So um, if a COBRA participant is Medicare eligible, do his or her dependents, um, do they still have COBRA options? Oh, that is an excellent question. So there is a little caveat to that. Um, Medicare eligibility by itself is not a qualifying event, even though the Department of Labor indicates so. Um, it is where if the participant was forced into Medicare and had to terminate their group insurance, at that point, would it be COBRA eligible? Now, with that being said, um, if the carrier is treating that as a qualifying event, which I believe that most of ours do, then yes, the COBRA coverage would be available to the participants. But that decision does need to be made at the carrier and employer level. And then the TPA um, task would actually, you know, enroll them in our service for COBRA. So it, there are two sides to that. Um, and again, you've got the Department of Labor that is very vague in that. Um, you know, it states that it is, but there are some caveats to it. And then you have our California carriers that they just re-enroll. So if you have that come up, please, you know, go back to your carrier and make sure that the employer does want to allow that as a qualified event. Okay, thank you. Now, mm -hmm. I know that you, you went through a long list of benefits that are in which COBRA applies to those benefits. Yes, now, I'll go back to that. I know that they apply on the federal level and the same application exists for CalCOBRA, correct? That would be correct. Okay, I just wanted to, to clarify that for someone. Now, let's say that if an employee, you know, did not elect medical coverage during their open enrollment and then they're later terminated, um, they are not COBRA eligible, but is there a notice of some kind that should go, that should be provided to that employee letting them know that they're not eligible for coverage? Well, they should, um, you know, I'll verify that um, because they are not receiving that initial notice. I will um, go to my library and see if there is a form that we can actually provide and I'll have that emailed out to you for reference. Okay, thank you. Now, but whenever that employee was hired, they should have received an initial notice, correct? Well, the initial notice typically goes out within 90 days of enrollment, so it's not a 
um, initial notice for uh, it's it's for their COBRA rights, and the law says that it's in within 90 days of their enrollment. They have to have the initial notice. Now the employer can elect just to have a initial notices sent out when they are hired. You know, under the assumption that they are going to enroll. Oh, okay. Um, but that that not that is not the law. So if they did not give the initial notice when they were hired they're not in any violation because it must go out within 90 days of being enrolled. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Thank you. Now, I have a question in regard to, so an employee, you know, they either resign or they're terminated and they elect COBRA. And they later learn that as a result of their you know, termination, they're, maybe they're unable to find another job, their income drops, they now become el potentially eligible for a subsidy through the state exchange, through Covered California. If that employee chooses to drop their COBRA coverage, is that a qualifying event or it, to allow them to enroll in the exchange? I will verify that, but I do not believe so. I believe they have their 30 days after their group health plan ends where they have to make their determination whether they want COBRA or to go into the exchange. And if they do not elect at that period, they do have to wait until open enrollment. But I will verify that. Okay. That I mean, that, that, initial understanding. Yeah, that's our understanding as well. I just wanted to. Yeah, I'll see if there is something out there that... Um, says something different than what we all understand. Okay. Now, are there guidelines or a definition? Uh, has there been a definition provided for gross misconduct? Um, there is a definition for gross misconduct. I do not have that in front of me, but I will um, get that over to you. But that would be, um, you know, the 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 first one that comes to my mind is embezzlement, of course. You know, that would not be one that you would offer COBRA, and that is, you know, that is that one is pretty clear. <laughs> now, if they haven't been convicted, you know, of course, there's always that gray area, but embezzlement, um, theft, harassment, things like that. So, um, but I'll get a, a list over to you. Okay. Thank you. That would be helpful. Now, um, if a com this is kind of going back to the size of a company and the timeline, or at which point does an employer have to comply with federal COBRA? So if we have, you know, a company that's growing and they, they just reached, you know, 20 employees this month, at what point do they have to switch over to federal COBRA? So it would, they would need to be uh, more than 20 for the rest of this year to be eligible for federal COBRA. And then typically it would be done on January 1. So according to the law with the Department of Labor, they would be able to remain a small group for the rest of this year because they have to be 20 or more for 50% or more of the previous calendar year. Now there could be um, a different opinion with your carrier. So they may determine at some point that once your employee hits more than 20, they want you to do federal COBRA the next month. So the law says within you know, more than 50% of the previous calendar year, so therefore that would be January 1, but you will want to check with your carriers to see what their procedure is. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, a question for you in regard to um, if someone either doesn't elect coverage, this is really more about task services. If they don't elect COBRA or if they don't pay timely, then does TAS notify the employer or the carrier, but um, 
when that election or when that payment doesn't take place because carriers are becoming much less flexible in regard to retro terminations and reimbursing you know the employer for premiums that have been paid but you know not accessed mm -hmm. absolutely so that's an excellent question so with task um, I'll just review our service offering briefly and then we can go into um, that part of it so we do actually send the initial notices out. Uh, we do take care of sending out the election notices and um, collecting the premium once they have elected. Now we do um, not send the premium to the carrier and we do not notify the carrier um, of any additions or terminations to COBRA. With that being said, we could actually re-enroll and terminate with the carrier for COBRA and we could send the premiums there. Uh, the latter is not a recommendation because, of course, our carriers um, sometimes are not able to identify outside of the participant if the group name is not anywhere on the check. Um, we do notify the employer once we have received the election notice and once we have received um, the premium payment or not received either. And we do that via an email. We notify them that there is uh, recent activity and basically they are to log on to our online system and they have immediate access to the election notice and to know whether or not the, the payment was received. The guidelines for the payment though are still you know, it's that 45 days out, so if you have an employee that was terminated, they're probably going to wait that full 60 days to see if they have something that they've needed to go to the doctor for before they elect. So they, if they elect on day 60, they still have that 45 days to pay that premium. So we're now 105 days out. And Unfortunately, you know, the, the carriers may be a little difficult, but um, there has to be a way, you know, to assist if the employee takes that full 105 days because the 105 days is the law. So if they're having, if you're having problems getting, you know, refunds back because of that, uh, I would reach out to, you know, your TPA and see if they can offer any assistance and you know if you're working with task I'd be glad to assist with that and see what we can work out with the carrier because that's they should be following the law okay thank you um, no I actually I I do not have any additional COBRA questions but if anyone does please you know go ahead and submit them in writing I want to step back to FSA um, as far as the the maximum contribution, we know that going you know going forward, or that ACA now requires a maximum contrib employee contribution of twenty five hundred dollars. But is that limit? Is there a limit imposed on employer contributions? Can an employer contribute in addition to that twenty five hundred, or in total is the maximum twenty five hundred? So the maximum employee salary deferral is $2,500. The employer can put additional dollars into the plan on top of that. Uh, they can put, as far as the health care FSA, um, they can put any dollar amount that they prefer with no limit. But under the um, legislation with Section 125, and the Affordable Care Act, they will want to limit that to either one times whatever the participant is putting in. So if the participant put in, you know, $300, then they could put in an additional $300. Um, or if the participant is not contributing, a maximum of $500. Now, with that being said, you do have to contribute equally, so it is a catch-22, so our recommendation is to keep the plan in compliance, to not put any more than an additional $500 in to the healthcare FSA. 
and if they want to allow more money to go to the employees, then the best way to do that is actually a gross up in salary, and then those employees do turn around and make that salary deferral election into any of the benefits into the FSA. And that is the only way, unfortunately, that you can discriminate is to do the gross up in salary. And that is becoming more and more common in today's marketplace. Okay, well thank you, Cinnamon. It looks like that is the, the last of our our questions. And I just I do want to remind everyone that we have recorded today's presentation. We, you know, we will post it on our, our website under our webinars and education page as we always do, but we will be sending out a link as well as the presentation slides to you tomorrow. And if you want to learn more about TAS offerings, you know, through Bear and Purvis, we will include information in the email as well. Um, but certainly you can always visit, you know, the Broker Picks page on our website as well as talk to your sales rep about it. They have information available with them at all times as well. So thank you very much. I want to um, thank you know, Cinnamon for joining us today and providing with the latest updates on FSA and COBRA. And I think we can call it a wrap. Great. Thank you, Stacy. And please accept my apologies for my computer snafus. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, thank you, everyone. And have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.